Okay, um, so the Carpathians, uh, Europe's forgotten mountains is what I've called them. Um, and I think it's fair enough to describe them like that because a lot of people don't even know where they are. So that's going to be the first thing. Where are the Carpathians? Well, they're across here in Eastern Europe um, and they straddle several countries, as of course the Alps do and as the Pyrenees do. They're an international mountain range, which is one of the lovely things about them. The Carpathians uh, start here in the West in, in fact, Slovakia, uh, and then they go right along here, along the border with Poland. So there's Poland to the north, Slovakia to the south, and then they arch right round here through Western Ukraine, an area which Nature Trek doesn't currently offer tours to, but then south into this area here of Romania, where they continue right the way down towards the south, and then turn back west again, just north of the Danube Plain, which is this, this lowland area down here where the capital Bucharest is. The mountains then continue on for several hundred more kilometers, right across the uh, Danube cuts through them, and they continue right down here into Serbia before effectively joining up with the Balkans, which are a little bit further south. So this great arc of mountains going from Slovakia and Poland through Ukraine and right down into Romania. Now, Nature Trek does offer um, tours to the Slovakian mountains in this sort of area here, mainly for butterflies, uh, but also plants in that area too. And there is also a very exciting mammals trip, which I'll talk about uh, a little bit later on in this southeastern corner of um, uh, Poland, in an area here called Bishchady, which in fact pushes that it's the little little peninsula of Poland that sticks right into Ukraine. Absolutely secure, perfectly safe. The trip is running this year, and in fact, just in a couple of weeks' time. Um, but I'm mainly going to be talking to you about my experiences um, in this part of the Carpathians, in the Romanian Carpathians. So let's get started then. Now, this is the vision we have, and we've seen this vision when we think of um, European mountain habitats and the wonderful landscape and scenery. This is the Polish Tatras, which if you remember, is this part of the Carpathians right up here in the north. This is the highest and most truly alpine part of the Cap Carpathians, but it's actually a bit of an anomaly. Most of the Carpathians, while they may have montane, alpine, largely tree-free uh, peaks in the uh, in the background as the backdrop, as it were, most of the Carpathians are actually much, much lower, gentler, more kind of rolling mountains. In some areas, more like a range of hills uh, than like the true sort of jagged mountain peaks. So they're rather more subtle than the Pyrenees uh, or the Alps, and they make a very refreshing change for all that. And they're a beautiful mix of picturesque villages in various different styles, um, there are um, open grassy meadows and then woodlands, which change as you go up the mountains, mostly dominated by beach at the lower altitudes. And then as you go up, you can start to see the first few silver fir trees appearing here. And then when you get up really high, you'd expect many more fir and pine species dominating before you reach the tree line uh, way up here, at maybe two and a half thousand, maybe 2000 meters or so. So it's a really varied habitat, but rather a gentler mountain range than the Alps or the Pyrenees. They do get very snowy in the winter, but the snow melts rather earlier in the spring. So the walking season uh, starts a little bit earlier. And during the, um, the months that Nature Trek tends to go there during May right through to August for different sorts of trips, the snow has certainly gone from the areas that we visit. Um, there may still be some remnant snow patches on the very, very highest peaks, but they're very, very beautiful, extraordinarily empty. And what's really remarkable about the Carpathians is that it's like stepping back in time. In Romania in particular, a country that only joined the EU, uh, well, a few years before we left it, but um, only joined the EU quite recently, its agricultural system is really... Um, the sort of thing that you might have found in Britain in the 19th century or at latest the early 20th century. So you see uh, hay meadows everywhere with hay that is cut still by hand with scythes uh, in June 
uh, and then put to dry on these ricks or various structures that you see. So these, what I like to call hay monsters, dotted around the lowland landscape. And this means that you have a very, very flower rich habitat in the spring and in the summer, you have the grassy swards and the woods filled with lots and lots of um, quite often quite common European birds, but they are in extreme abundance. You can even see up at the top of the screen here that in some areas strip farming is still uh, practiced. So it really is this return to an earlier age. Lots and lots of wooden buildings, horse-drawn um, and indeed horse-worked agriculture going on, um, shepherds still uh, tending their flocks high in the mountains, moving their animals up and down. It's, it's still um, this remarkable uh, survival of medieval European agriculture. And this means, of course, that the birds associated with agricultural landscape um, have survived and are indeed thriving still in these landscapes. So one of the commoner birds, in fact, that you see in the Romanian lowland areas of the Carpathians, down in the, riv in the river valleys, in the agricultural areas, in this case, sitting on top of a rusty old tractor, are things like red-backed shrikes, which of course have sadly been lost from Britain and are declining in most of Western Europe, but are still delightfully abundant in um, Southeast Europe, notably in Romania. Another absolutely common and typical bird of these river valleys, the agricultural areas, lots and lots of white storks feeding, looking for invertebrates, frogs, insects, grasshoppers, and so on in the fields, and then flying into the towns, there's stork's nests uh, right opposite our um, hotel, which we'll see in a few moments time, um, in the uh, little Romanian mountain town of Vulcan, which is so named because it's right opposite an extinct volcano. Extinct, that's the good news. Uh, so lots of white storks around, but there are also more spectacular and unexpected species, things like lesser spotted eagles, one of just, um, just one of a whole range of different raptors, uh, which can be seen um, flying around the meadows and over the mountains and over the woodlands and so on. Uh, and you can expect a whole range of those. Uh, two different species of buzzards can be seen in this area. There are hobbies are common, all sorts of birds of prey uh, to be seen. And the lesser spotted eagles, they will often drop right down into the farmed areas. And you can see them hopping around on the ground right by the side of the road. So here's a photo uh, that I took of uh, the group I led to Romania last May. Um, so as I was explaining to you, most, most of the habitation is down here in little towns and villages in the valley floor. Um, and then as you gradually go up the sides of the valleys, go through these open pastures and meadows and so on, and then higher up still into open woodlands and then denser woodlands, and then eventually, were you to get all the way up high into the mountain tops, uh, you might get into the true alpine environments. We don't tend to do that in Romania because it's a serious mountaineering undertaking to get up that high. And the infrastructure of things like cable cars and flashy little mountain railways that we've been seeing in Switzerland earlier on simply don't exist. So to get up onto the top of the mountains at the back there, the Crialu Mountains, uh, would be a, a sort of a two, three day expedition to fully traverse that ridge. So don't worry, no one's going to be expecting you to do that. Instead, we go for gentle day walks. This is the steepest track that we went on um, during our time in the Romanian Carpathian Mountains. And I think you'll agree, it doesn't look overly challenging. Bit of an uphill, but there's a wonderful little, well, there's the bus there, and there's a wonderful cafe just there, which does some of the best ice cream um, this side of Istanbul. Anyway, as you go up, as you get into the woodlands, then you encounter a species that's been mentioned uh, more than once, I think, this evening, and that is the resplendent nutcracker, which is a member of the crow family, believe it or not. I suppose you can, just about. Uh, but this is a very, very sought after species. It breeds quite widely in Scandinavia and in the mountains of Southern Europe, but it's often really quite hard to get to grips with. Uh, despite having a raucous call and sometimes flying over the forest canopy, it can be quite tricky to find. So we do spend a fair bit of time in the right sort of habitat, listening, scanning, watching closely. In the spring, they're actually quite hard to locate. But later on in the summer, when they've got youngsters like this one over here, you can tell which the 
immature bird is, can't you? Um, you can see they get very, very noisy. They're chasing around after their parents, begging for food, and they'll very often sit right up on the top of the pine trees um, and show perfectly for everyone to see uh, really, really well. So nutcracker is one of these really sought after species, exceptionally rare in Britain, but thankfully much easier to see in Europe's mountains. If you do get up really high, and this isn't an area that we visit on the particular tour that I led last May, um, then you'll find true alpine specialities. So for example, golden eagles live and nest up on those high crags, but of course they cover such large areas that we stand a very, very good chance of seeing them soaring over the mountains as we just walk around in the valleys and on the valley sides. Uh, up in the heights, there are the true alpine species, Alpine Accenta here. This is uh, one that I photographed in the Polish part of the Carpathians, but they do exist at these higher altitudes, but they're really quite hard to get to. However, earlier on this evening, you were shown one of the most sought after of all the montane species. Now, normally you have to climb to, in the Pyrenees, for example, to something like 3000 meters, or above, sometimes even higher, to even stand a chance of this next species. However, in Romania, we have a secret site. This involves walking up this very easy, barely uphill, graded track alongside a bubbling brook with grey wagtails and dippers um, zipping up and down the river, a lovely little half hour walk along this track until we get to this little concrete bridge. We then gather by the side of the road. We pause, we wait, we look with anticipation at this crack in the rock. I'm giving very, very detailed gen in this particular instance, and we wait. And then we hope, and indeed last May it happened, as if by magic, the wall creeper appears from around one of the headlands, lands on the cliff face, and we were very, very lucky in that the bird we saw uh, last year was singing, building a nest, even dropping down onto the path only about 10 meters away from us, flicking its wings, flashing those brilliant crimson flashes in the wings. It's one of the most accessible known sites for wall creeper. So um, if you're perhaps a little bit daunted by climbing up the very, very highest moraine and boulder covered screes of the Alps or the Pyrenees, you do stand a realistic chance we never use the word guarantee in wildlife tour leading. As Clint Eastwood once said, if you want a guarantee, buy a toaster. But you do have a very realistic chance um, of connecting with a wall creeper in the Carpathians of Romania in the spring and summer. But it's not just about birds. I'm not going to talk about plants for two reasons. We've had lots and lots of fantastic plants. Secondly, Actually, there's three reasons, really. Secondly, I don't really know all that much about um, the botanical side of things. It's certainly not my specialism. And thirdly, Nature Trek doesn't currently, at least, run purely or overwhelmingly botanical tours to the Carpathians. That may change in the future because there are a lot of exciting endemic um, and rather exotic Carpathian plants, but it's not a tour that we've got developed just at the moment. However, there are lots of wonderful things to see apart from the birds. First of all, they're the landscapes themselves. There's the vernacular architecture with the sort of fascinating barns and farm buildings and so on. Remote shepherd's huts in clearings, thatched roofs, which are only used during the summer season. Um, the uh, kind of Saxon style of the big sort of A-framed symmetrical uh, buildings. And this, in fact, is the um, hotel that I mentioned to you earlier on, a really beautiful um, converted Saxon farmhouse with absolutely immaculate rooms, superb food, stripped wood floors everywhere, and a delightful guardian garden out the back with Syrian woodpeckers in it. It's a really lovely place to stay in a lovely quiet village um, in one of the valley floors. It's not just um, functional architecture. There's also this Gothic fantasy of a uh, royal hunting lodge perched up amongst the woodlands filled with red-breasted flycatchers uh, and other delights of the, um, uh, the mountain forests. And then perhaps most notoriously is this. This is Bran Castle, which stands at the gateway to Transylvania, 
So as you enter the uh, Carpathian uh, Mountains from uh, Bucharest, from the south, the first town you come to is Bran. Um, now this has variously been alleged to have been one of the homes or um, owned by Vlad Tepes, um, the infamous Vlad the Impaler, uh, and indeed, it's also been alleged to be, ah, this is Dracula's castle. This is what Bram Stoker had in mind when he was writing his novel in the late 19th century. I'm afraid I have to tell you that neither of these things is in fact true, but because this is the first plausible looking castle that you come to when you get to Transylvania, the Romanian tourist board does give it a bit of a push. Nonetheless, we do go and visit Bram, have a nice meal there uh, and enjoy the somewhat touristy but quite entertaining uh, delights of Bran. Back to the wildlife, I think. Uh, there are lots and lots of butterflies to be seen. Many um, of the groups we've talked about earlier this evening, coppers, fritillaries, hair streaks, uh, purple emperor is uh, not uncommon in some of the woodlands. And this is a really subtle and delightful species, the map butterfly very interesting maps. They actually occur in two generations through the spring and summer. And the two generations look very, very different from each other, almost as though they were different species. But they are in fact the same species, but the two generations uh, just look almost completely different from one another. Fire salamander. I'm not sure whether this is the same uh, species as the alpine salamander we saw earlier, but the fire salamander, the um, male in all its glory uh, with the yellow and black uh, finery is certainly a thing to see and this is a realistic target in some of the wet woodlands especially if it's been raining so there's a, a thing to look forward to on one of those unfortunate wet days but we do have a good chance of finding those in amongst the leaf litter. Mammals as well the Carpathians are absolutely superb for mammals they have an almost com almost complete set of all the European uh, certainly larger mammals. There are chamois up high, often visible on ledges, well out of uh, uh, well out of range, but you can see them quite easily and well with telescopes and binoculars. There are marmots in the Carpathians as well. Their Slavic name is Manushka. I don't they actually know their Romanian name, but the, uh, they're known as Manushkas in Slovakia uh, and Poland, and they're delightfully common and confiding. There are bison in the Carpathians. This is a recent development. They've been reintroduced into the Carpathians where they went extinct several hundred years ago uh, from uh, Poland where the last remaining wild herds of European bison hung on right out on the border with Belarus. Uh, but they've been reintroduced to the Southern Carpathians in some quite restricted areas and certainly areas without good general access. It's not the best place to go and look for European bison. Uh, that's still um, your best bet is one of the Eastern Poland uh, tours where you have a very realistic chance of, of seeing them. And of course, they're true wild species that have been there, you know, since time immemorial. This, however, the Eurasian lynx is uh, one of the stars of the Carpathians. There is a healthy population of Eurasian lynx. They are I think it's fair to say almost never seen by the general public, but um, as I mentioned um, earlier on, I think um, Nature Trek runs a trip um, into the far southeast of Poland, focusing strongly on the difficult, rare and tricky mammals, especially the real jewel in the crown is Eurasian lynx. It's by no means guaranteed, but there has been a good success rate um, in recent years. This is an even harder species to see, in fact, than the much rarer, in terms of global population, Spanish lynx, which some of you might have uh, encountered down in uh, Iberia. However, there is one mammal for which Romania's Carpathians are justly famous and give you an excellent chance of seeing. And you will see the signs, things like footprints and sometimes scat and markings on trees. Um, and when you see these big very big fresh footprints, you should genuinely be just a little bit cautious because there's bears in those woods. Now, the European brown bear is in fact the same species as the North American grizzly bear, different subspecies, but the Romanian Carpathians are one of the most accessible places for seeing these animals in their natural habitat. 
Now, you will find cheap knockoff tours that will take you to a rubbish dump or the bins around the back of McDonald's in some grim area in a mountain town. And as we know, know I think a, a fed bear is a dead bear, certainly in that sort of environment. However, up in the mountains for several decades now, they've been developing um, a sustainable form of ecotourism where small amounts of semi-natural food are put out for the bears and small populations of the bears have become habituated. They're absolutely wild animals. And if you make significant noise when you're sitting in the hide viewing the bears, they will scarper and be gone and that'll be it. They're extremely shy, extremely wary, but you stand a very, very good chance of encountering, encountering European brown bear in the, European, uh, in the Romanian Carpathians. And if you're quiet, if you're lucky, if you're patient, if you sit still and don't make lots of rustling and banging in the very comfortable hides, then you stand a good chance of encountering not just the odd bear, but last May we saw no fewer than 11 brown bears, including three family parties of mothers with cubs of different ages. And that's a real privilege to be so close to such an awesome um, and iconic large predatory animal. However, we did manage to best that um, and I'm going to share, I've saved the very best sighting till last on that trip we did last May. Um, when we were in that same gorge where we saw the wall creeper earlier on, one member of the group detected movement in the undergrowth, I would say undergrowth, more leaf litter and rocky scree on the side of the valley. So we all froze and stopped. And then someone else said, oh, I saw it again, it just moved, it went into that hole in the rock. So we all set up our binoculars and telescopes and waited and paused, our, our breath held, waiting for the what we thought it might possibly be. And we thought, surely it can't be. But what, what came out was a species so rare that I think I'm right in saying it's the first time it has ever been recorded by a nature trek trip. And we all dined out on this one. So we did manage to get one photo, a brief snap photo in the gloom of the beech forests of the Carpathians. We managed to see a montane water vole. A fearsome predator, as you can see, terrifying to the invertebrate prey on which it feeds. The montane water vole has recently, in fact, been split from the European lowland water vole and is its own species. And as I say, we think that was the very first time it's ever been recorded on a nature trek trip. So rather exciting. Forgive my attempt at comedy, I hope, but there it is. It, it's very peculiar because it lives in the leaf litter, as you can see. It doesn't spend its time swimming up and down rivers. It spends its time mostly in the woodlands. So it does seem to have a very different way of behaving from its lowland cousin. So as the sun sets over the Romanian Carpathians, we'll um, bring things to a close there. Uh, and I'll hand back over to um, Kerry, who I'm sure will... Um, take over with any questions and hopefully answers.